From the land of sky blue waters, welcome to the Soda Pod. Isha Droma here alongside Seth Topol, and I thank you all for joining us wherever and whenever you are listening. Guys, we're going to jump right into it today. We have a huge, huge segment of hockey talk, Minnesota wild talk, playoff talk, prospect talk, and just some world hockey news as well. I talked about a pretty, well, quite frankly, messed up story involving allegations of sexual assault coming out of that small league on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Well, the trial is over. We have an update on that. And Seth and I unravel it all. No hoppy hour in this episode. It's been a really busy week. As you guys know, we had to delay the episode to drop today. There is a beer vlog that is dropping on YouTube. And then next week, I will update you guys on how we're going to incorporate the hoppy hour into the audio side of things. That A, makes it a little bit more crisp, clean, bearable, as well as an extended all video portion of the hoppy hour on YouTube. So we'll update you guys on our plans with that moving forward next week. But no hoppy hour in this episode. I did hit up prize brewing last week and there's a full brewery vlog on the channel. It probably won't be up on the channel until later today if you're listening to this Thursday morning. And if you're also supposed to And if you're also subscribed to my personal channel, The City Life Project, it will be up there as well. So no hoppy hour in this particular podcast, just near an hour and a half of hockey talk. So without further ado, let's get right into it again. If you want the full experience of the show, even this one, as we do share some visual graphics and clips on screen. Go check us out on YouTube at The Soda Pod. Like and subscribe. Leave a comment. And if if you have any suggestions on how you want us, either on the audio side or the video side, to tackle The Soda Pod moving forward, I mean, this is your guys' show. Love the feedback. Love the comments. And it just helps the algorithm on YouTube. So it's uh, it's like getting two birds stoned at once. Before we get into the hockey talk here, I just want to give a big shout out to our friends at Northland Vodka. Northland Vodka is the best vodka in the state, in the United States, ladies and gentlemen. Great people, amazing team, and local company, Mark Parrish and everybody there are amazing. They're doing multiple signings, they're doing multiple appearances at events all summer, so be sure to follow them on social media at Northland Vodka to stay up to date with that. And a percentage of local sales as well, ladies and gentlemen, go back in to the community, go back into local hockey. So what are you waiting for? Go pick yourself up some Northland today. Northland Vodka, a proud partner of the Soda Pod. Without further ado, like I said, let's bring on Seth Topol from Locked on Wild. And we are back for another hockey segment here on the Soda Pod. What's up, Seth? What's happening, Isha? A little later in the week this time, but uh, we both were unable to to do a podcast on Sunday. So, uh, so here we are later in the week. But you know what? That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, even if it's even if it's not on our normal day, we still find a way. Absolutely. Oh, well, look at that bust bust of rhymes over here. <laughs> did not, honestly, I did not even I did not attempt that. That's just. <laughs> Sometimes it's better to be uh, lucky than good. Okay, so on that topic, though, um, Drake or Kendrick, who's winning the beef? Yes. <laughs> hey, despite being the Canadian, I'm, I'm team Kendrick all the way. <laughs> I, I've heard some of the stuff, so I guess I would have to say Kendrick, um, but I am not... Um, I'm not well versed in the uh, the rap game, or as much as I probably should be. Uh, ask Micheletti for me, because I'm sure he's listened to all the songs. We'll uh, we'll we'll broach that. We'll broach that subject. He's gonna be like, "Wait, why did Isha ask you to ask me that?" <laughs> 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 Love you, Alex. Love you. Um. All right. Yeah. Let's let's dive into it, guys. We uh, Hawk, Hoppy Z, MNCAA, Max Veach. Uh, Joe Smith and Greg Wyshynski all holding the fort down earlier this week. A lot of content dropping on this YouTube channel, on the podcast. So appreciate 
all you guys for listening. And if you haven't caught up with the bonus episode yet, which dropped on Monday in place of this episode, but you wanted to watch the whole thing, that will be dropping tomorrow on the YouTube channel. Uh, so be prepared for that. But uh, we have some topics here to get into here today. Wild topics, junior hop, junior hockey topics. Um, I, in the intro of last week's episode, talked about that that terrible incident that occurred uh, in Nanaimo in the Vancouver Island Junior Hockey League. That case wrapped up. Seth and I are going to talk about, well, what uh, what transpired six days later. And also, a certain National Hockey League free agent uh, that potentially could sign with the Wild. Did you hear my voice go up three octaves there? It's going to be a fun conversation. Let's dive into it. And let's start with Hunter Haight, Minnesota Wild prospect. Hunter Haight has won the Memorial Cup this year with the Saginaw Spirit representing the OHL. And Seth, I have to say, I imagine, I mean, other than uh, whatever this fucking Quebec team uh, that made it in, they were the underdog. Now, the Quebec team didn't win a single game in the Memorial Cup, but out of the, let's just say the big three, out of the Moose Jaw Warriors, out of the London Knights, and uh, obviously the Saginaw Spirits, they were the underdogs. They were the underdogs. They were the youngest team out of the three big ones there. They had more players who didn't necessarily hit like triple digits throughout their season points wise. They didn't have the superstars, those highly ranked prospects, those elite, th those prospects that show elite talent, the elite of the elite in the junior ranks anyways on their team, but they got it done by committee, which was a beautiful thing. As you guys can see right here, if you're watching on YouTube, Saginaw Spirit, five games played, one, four, lost one. I mean, it, it was awesome to see. It was awesome to see. Again, like I said, especially against a team that's always stacked, always stacked in the London Knights. Moose Jaw representing my WHL. They got spanked 1-3 uh, in the tournament. They did have 14 goals for, uh, but 20 goals against. But that just shows like the 20 or the 14 goals for, like they, they had a lot of talent on that team. I'm glad the London Knights couldn't quote unquote buy another championship as the London Knights are uh infamously known uh whether it's you know jokingly or not for <laughs> you know paying some of their uh junior hockey players cash money under the table to come to their franchise as it is one of the uh one of the better one of the more well-respected franchises in the chl but um seth i just wanted to, to ask you like if you caught any of like hunter heights highlights his post game and, and what this means for him in his now transition into pro hockey and potentially joining Iowa. You know, the thing that I like here, because this is something I've been asked by fans at uh, various points is I I'm just glad that the wild now have somebody they can put into their system that has experience, like making a, a, a postseason run and winning, uh, winning a cup because, there are a lot of different things. Um, there are a lot of different things that you have to have go well to make one of these types of runs. And the Iowa wild themselves just don't have a ton of guys that um, they just don't have a ton of guys that have a lot of postseason experience. And so if you can bring somebody in that when they get to that level can say, relax guys like you let's say you lose you know game one of a series it's not over we just have to regroup and uh and go get him and it's also i think it adds to it that he uh himself had a uh a great postseason like nine goals in 17 games is pretty darn good yeah um so it's it's not like it's not like hunter was you know along for the ride he certainly uh certainly contributed in um in helping them get to this point, but it's just, I'm, I'm a huge favor of adding any level of postseason experience you can to an organization because somebody at some point has to either be the one to kind of step up and say, all right, I'm going to take the lead or you find somebody that knows the, like when it's crunch time, that's that things have to happen. You, you just, you got to find ways to get those players into your organization. 
Absolutely. And like dominated in the postseason and then going into the Memorial Cup because you got to win your postseason unless you're the host team to stamp your ticket into the Memorial Cup. And what I love about this group of guys here is they did it by committee. I mean, look at the ages of some of these guys here. And I'll bring up the London Knights and um, Moose Jaw here in a sec. So if you guys are watching on YouTube, you can see all the stats on screen. But we'll read a few of them out here. Like um, uh, Zane uh, Parek, who's I believe going to be a high draft pick this year 17 years of age 16 year old who by the way my god michael misa i mean 75 points 67 games 29 goals as a 16 year old 19 18 19 points for a defenseman z and hoppy talk about him uh, quite a bit he's he's unbelievable but just look at the ages i mean obviously very talented young guys here and freaking did it with this team Right, a young team were able to stamp their ticket to the Memorial Cup and have the discipline to take on two juggernauts like the Moose Jaw Warriors and the London Knights. I mean, the London Knights every year put together a great team. That's you know they're they're like um, they're they're like the Mooseheads in the QMJHL. They're like you know Kelowna historically in the in the WHL. Like there's just a few franchises that always always ice a good team because well they got the money and resources uh to do it but like very young amazing talent here but what's awesome about it is they bought in right so at, at a young age and a young core here limited i mean j- just by watching them play throughout this tournament and towards the end of the season you could see that there was there was limited ego overall you know they, they played for each other they bought into the system and they got it done, Seth. They got it done. Like, uh, for reference here, I'm going to bring up London Knights roster. And you can just see some of the, the A, the age difference and just the experience difference between some of these guys. I mean, we got some guys in triple digits here. 18, 18, 19, 18, 20, 18, 18, right? Even, even with the Moose Jaw Warriors, man, even with the Moose Jaw Warriors, they had a lot of older kids as well. Now, I know, like, one year... But in one, one year in junior hockey, one year in development is, is is huge, man. And as you can see with Moose Jaw over here as well, a lot of 19 and 8-year-olds, 20-year-olds. Hell, Moose Jaw is even an older team, uh, I'd argue, than, than the London Knights. Yeah, Saginaw bit down on their mouthpiece, and they were able to get it done. So I'm, I'm super proud of that group of guys, despite Moose Jaw not winning, despite the representative from my favorite league, the WHL, not getting it done. I think this team really, really earned their spot. And Hunter Height, man, he looked looked awesome. He looked awesome, and he was just oozing confidence in the last game as well uh, to take the... uh, well, to take the Memorial Cup. So super proud of him. Cannot wait to see what he will bring to both, uh, well, wild training camp. But let's be honest, he, he's going to be on the Iowa wild. He's not going to make the Minnesota yeah. wild. Um, and if he does, holy shit, like that's crazy. But I, I, I'm i I'm not expecting him to, nor, nor the scouts are really, really anybody right now. Yeah, I would say of the heights, I think it's pretty widely, it's pretty widely expected that Riley Heights will be the one to yes. uh, to really push for a roster spot but Hunter and, and you know, the, like this is the part of it too is like the the top 6 you could even say the top 9 is pretty full right now and so if it takes Hunter um if it takes him a little bit uh if it takes him a little bit to kind of get to the NHL level that's perfectly fine oh yeah well, especially cuz Iowa's a rebuilding team right now what they finished what second last in the league so yes yeah not great not great but they got a young core there as well and like i said i just just won a championship with a young core so i feel like just just that little little bit of confidence a little bit of experience based on this last tournament going into camp this year I think that's huge. I think that's huge. And obviously I think the Iowa wild and thus obviously the, the Minnesota wild, they've addressed some things with the farm team. I mean, obviously Matt Hendricks is going to be uh, manning the ship down there. There's going to be some adjustments. They're going to address probably some more veterans, probably in the bottom six, but to at least be the glue to yeah. this young core. And then, you know, knock on knock on wood, not many injuries for the Minnesota, but if there are injuries, maybe they give some of these young guys those opportunities so they don't have to draw from the guys who will hold that core together like they did this year. And I'm not, and I'm not blaming them. It was the right move to do this year because they had to do it. And I mean, you know, the, the likes of Mermis, he needed to come up because the Wild, yeah. it was so early in the season that, you know, they, they weren't able to give the Ugrins a chance to play knowing that like, 
it was all over. Basically, the Wilds decor, uh, Iowa's decor, their oldest prospect until they got Will Butcher, their oldest prospect was 24 years old. Most yeah. of them were 21, 22. And so I know that has led to some kind of concerns as to are these guys being pushed in the appropriate direction from a development standpoint, but this is why teams have veterans. This is why teams have vet players, even, even AHL teams. This is why they have veteran players is to be able to be kind of a sounding board for these young guys. And Iowa really did not have a ton of those guys this past year. And so, um, that can be a way to explain all the struggles that they had and the inconsistencies. I will be shocked. I will be shocked if we have really any of what happens this past year happen again. And that's not to say that I think the Minnesota wild are going to be, you know, head and shoulders better. I, it just, it was an otherworldly level of injuries that affected the entire organization. And, the the inconsistency stuff i just don't see that happening for a second consecutive season yeah and and there was such a big injection of youth into iowa with yeah. guys who weren't necessarily nhl caliber yet like when rossi was down there he's putting up point per game he was the guy right he was the guy even though he was the same age as some of his peers down there he was the guy and look what he did in the national hockey league right he, yeah. he was 40 points, right? Whereas, you know, some of these guys were barely even hitting like 30 points as forwards down there as, you know, part of that new crop of guys. You know, going from junior to pro, it doesn't matter if it's the, the AHL, doesn't matter if it's the KHL, doesn't matter if the NHL, whatever the pro league, like it is a massive step up uh, in competition. It, it, it is everywhere, everywhere on, in the world right now. I mean, even, even in the LNAH, man. <laughs> <laughs> where they're taking away all your space, beating the shit out of each other. By the way, I just have to say on just that topic there, um, um, Donald Brashear officially retiring from professional hockey at the age of 52. He played his last few seasons with the, with the LNAH. I believe he got eight or nine points this season around that area and, uh, and gotten a few fights as well. So big shout out to yeah. Donald Brashear this year, still mucking it up in the, in the Quebec enforcer league. If I'm doing anything at 50, I'm going to be majorly impressed. What a career he had, though, man. Um, I believe he started his... I'm just going to bring his DB up here. I believe he started his NHL career... Um, yeah, when I was born in 1993. He played his first year with the Montreal Canadiens. And was still playing hockey up until this season. Look at this. Look at this. Spent time with the Montreal Canadiens, Vancouver Canucks, Philadelphia Flyers, Washington Capitals, New York Rangers, and uh, came basically. <laughs> it's funny between 2015 and 16, he was playing in like men's leagues, so he wasn't playing like pro. He was actually fighting some MMA, and now that then, then he came back for one last run um, with the LNAH, and yeah, eight points, two goals, 35 pims, got in two pretty big fights. I mean, what a way to test yourself one more time in a brutal league like the LNH. So just big, big shout out to John LeBurst here. What a, what a career, man. What a career. Hey, if you still got it, go for it. You don't, uh, don't let yourself, don't let yourself do like not be able to do something you think you can do. At least, at least go for it. Dude, he had an MMA fight when he was freaking like 47 years old or 48 years old. Okay. That I definitely will not be able to do. <laughs> I can't do one now. I heard that like his camp wanted to make a clause that was like no takedowns, but the guy went in for a takedown. And he just uppercutted him and knocked him the hell out. Shout out brush here. <laughs> well, that's uh that's quintessential F round and find out. Absolutely. Like, hey, I just because you're old, I'm going to try to knock you down. Yeah, go ahead, buddy. Go yeah. ahead and try. Amazing. Um, let's uh, let's keep talking about the Minnesota Wild a little bit more here. Um, assistant coach. Darby Hendrickson relieved of his coaching duty, duties after 14 seasons with the Minnesota Wild. He was hired on in 2010. Seth, I didn't realize he was there for that long. I knew he was there for a long time. I didn't realize he was there for that long. So, again, uh, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. It's sad. But I understand now why they wanted to move on, right? A new a new fresh look behind the bench. But my, my question for you is, was this more about allowing Hines to bring in his own guys and less about, you know, quote unquote performance 
and fit with the team since he clearly fit with the team being a staple there for 14 seasons? You know, this is I've I've gone back and forth about this one a lot because my whole point about this entire decision is like, is this really going to make a huge difference? Like, was Darby somebody who was responsible for enough that we're going to notice the differences going into next season? Because obviously John Hines isn't going anywhere. Bill Guerin is not going anywhere. And so at that point, you only have a um, you only have a finite number of changes that you can make to a coaching staff. Um, and by all accounts, Jason King is is still going to uh, to stay on as a power play coach. And look, the power he was play, only one year in, though, right? Like, because he was yeah, hired last year, right? Um, and statistically, the power play did have a uh, a good year. It was. It was con- inconsistent, though, but but better statistically, than the year before, better than the year before. Yeah, statistically, they still had a, a good power play. They had a top ten power play, I think it was. Um, and the penalty kill, I think, um, after Dwyer stepped in, really took a leap um, in the the back half of the of the season. And so, I think you hope there that with a full off season, he can um, he can get that unit back towards that top ten. Um, and so at this point, that's pretty much the only change you can make. Cause you're, you're not going to, you're not going to dismiss Freddie Shabbat. I don't think until he is ready to step down. Yeah. And it feels like it, it felt like a little change was needed after what happened this past season. And so that's really the, about the only route that you have to go. Um, and I wonder if Heinz just has some names that he's like, I've worked with in the past or, you know, I've had success with, uh, you know, whatever level that, you know, I, I yeah. want to give a shot to, or if maybe there's just some names out there with, you know, the coaching carousel that is, or maybe some guys who, you know, they know, but we don't know are going to be relieved of their duty. I mean, as long as I don't bring in uh, Mike Yo as an assistant, cause he was just relieved of his duties in Vancouver. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of good with anyone at this point. Ironic that you mentioned that because somebody asked Russo because he threw out the name Jack Capuano, Ooh. who has been an assistant for a while. I, I really like that name, actually. He's he's a really good coach. He's been with the Senators the last yeah. couple of years, um, was with, I think, the Islanders before yeah. that. No, he he's a very good coach. He's a very okay. good coach. Um, so that was the name that was thrown out. And then somebody asked in response, what is Mike Yo doing right now? And Russo said, don't worry, he has a job lined up. Um, so he won't. Oh, in- interesting. Yeah, because yeah. he was he was he was fired from Vancouver a few weeks ago. He will he will still be finding jobs on coaching staffs in 2095. Like Mike Yo is always going to be an assistant coach that will occasionally fill in if a head coach gets let go, but um he just he he's he is like a I mean this in the most polite way possible. He's like a cockroach. He just he's just still there no matter what happens. God, like I just I'm I'm sorry. I I, I you say Mike Yo and I just think of his friggin' outburst. <laughs> that was just that was staged, outburst. wasn't it? I see it 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 was revealed that it was staged. Um now, was it staged to like like, did the players know that it wasn't real or, or was he just like, I'm going to try to do something to get the guys going and just like be a little bit over dramatic here? If I recall, I think it was his. I don't think the players knew. OK, I think he took the so he wasn't actually that pissed off. Yeah, he took the route of I have to do something to kind of jolt everybody and i don't i just don't have the uh you know i I don't think it was something he wanted to do but it's something he felt like he had to all right well let's take let's take a listen I believe this was in like 2011, 2012 when this went down. I uh, th- yes, I I do believe that was. Oh, 
<laughs> breaking his stick. the stick. <laughs> we up. Bull Guys, I'm ready to go. What, you think we don't need practice? Like, bro, we just skate. Like, we just we just skated lines here. What are you talking about? Yeah, like he, he, you can tell. Like, he's not he's not freaking like Bob Hartley throwing sticks in the audience or throwing sticks in the. You if know. I have if I have that correct, that it was, and I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure that's how it went down. That he was doing it as a bit. How do you keep a straight face? I know. Well, you can see there. It's just like <laughs> there's a difference when it's like genuine frustration. Whereas like, I mean, he did okay. I mean, he had a poker face going, yeah. but I, I, I don't know. I mean, in hindsight's 2020. When it happened, I was like, oh shit, Mikey was going ham there. But like, yeah, now now that we got to know and rewatching that, it's like there wasn't enough like true frustration. Not even just anger, but just like true frustration um and and it was almost forced the way that because he was just like he was swearing like he was almost like forcing it you know what i mean every um every person that has a like i just kind of snapped story you get kind of that you get kind of lip quiver yeah yes lip tremble um that is i think a, a good indication that it's it's really pouring out um I remember distinctly after the uh, loss to the Dallas Stars. I don't, I don't go nuts like all the time or really all that much. But I felt in that moment after that game, and I think I waited until I got back to uh, my apartment and was like, I gotta. I get a vent here a little bit. And so really just kind of let the, let the floodgates open up. But I remember like, I didn't really, I didn't really try to rehearse what I was going to say. Just let it flow. And that's when, that's when you get that real, like guttural primal anger. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's like, you just get a little, just in the corner of your mouth, you get a little quiver. Like your brain is like, Oh my God, he's actually like, he's actually angry. Well, in He's contrast, really in contrast, here's former uh, Calgary Flames coach uh, Bob Hartley. Now, I don't oh, think boy. this was staged at all. Or Glenn Gullickson, not Bob Hartley. Glenn Gullickson. My my apologies. Bob Hartley's a hothead too. That's why I got it mixed up there for a sec. See, because he just looks annoyed, right? He, he doesn't yeah. look angry. He just looks annoyed. And he's like, am I going to smash it? Nope, nope. Going to be a little professional. So check the fucking standings. Check the fucking standings. Yeah, see, that, that, that is genuine. Because he didn't want to do it. Chucking the stick in the stands. The lip quivered there. I saw it. I saw it. Let's practice. Let's go. That that is a genuine, you know, frustrated. That's, that's a genuinely frustrated coach there. It, you short like, but sweet too. Fifty-seven yeah. seconds, not two minutes and fifty seconds. We even play all the yo clip. <laughs> that's just when you know it's a genuine, genuine. Like I'm very upset. Yeah, it is you get a little little lip quiver and. I uh, I find that if I and again I, I rarely do this. My my thing has actually become if I get super upset, super angry at somebody, I just kind of go quiet. Mm. Like you you get kind of that like lion waiting in the weeds, and you just get really quiet, <laughs> and you say, "I am really holding back the urge to not just completely lose my mind right now." We're complete opposites. I just like, I just start spewing nonsense and just like, I get like flustered more than anything, you know, just like, yeah, like, uh, and yeah, it's, it's wild. It's wild, but uh, not weird. It's wild. But you know what got my lip quivering in anger the other day? Where all of these podcasts, all of these uh, 
Minnesota Wild fans suggesting that Marco Rossi should be a piece to be moved here in the near future for the Minnesota Wild. Now, what I will say in fairness is pretty much everyone and even the fans on social media made pretty good arguments for it. But for me, Seth, I don't know why the fans and and even some of these uh, writers and, and podcasters out there who are covering this team think that, not even think, want to give up on a potential top center. Like, are you really telling me that you've seen enough from one season in the National Hockey League that determines that this guy is just, oh, he's not a top center. He's just going to be a 40-point player for the for the rest of his career. Like, man, he's 22 years of age. It, it, blows, it blows my mind that this narrative is even being entertained right now. To me, it makes no sense. After decades of searching for a top center, they have a prospect who might reach that ceiling who might reach that ceiling and fans in the organization want to give him up after one year where he played every single game, 82 games, one of the few guys on the roster, despite being the smallest guy on the team, the only guy who didn't face injury to put him out of play, 21 goals and 40 points. I repeat, 40 points in his rookie season on the third freaking line. And you're telling me you want to give up on him already? Because that's what it is. You're get, trading him as giving up on a potential top center. Why do, why do the Wild want this, Seth? Or why are the Wild entertaining this? And, and why are the masses um, picking up on the story and rolling with it? Well, the only reason that this would be something you would contemplate doing is if you had something lined up that could get you a bona fide 1C. Because let's let's think about kind of how this would slot in. So let's say you have, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stop myself. You don't have the you don't have the cap space to do this right now. You don't have you have a lot of variables that you would have to really find a way to overcome to make what I'm about to suggest happen. The only reason that you trade a guy like Marco Rossi is if you are bringing in somebody that is going to be your bona fide number one C and then Jewel Erickson Eck is your second center. And it from a perspective of feeling the pressure of having to win now, like those are the only ways that I can understand the logic as to why this is being pursued because you hit it right on the head. It is at this point giving up on a guy who just showed you that he is capable of getting through an NHL season and being a productive member of your group. He was tied with Ryan Hartman for fourth most goals on the team behind Kirill Kaprizov, Matt Boldy, Jewel Eriksson Ek. He got to 21 goals with Matt Zuccarello having what we all would consider a pretty down season, save when he played with Kirill Kaprizov. He, I think he had something like 85% of his points came with Kirill. Uh, and so you've got Matt Zuccarello as your one of your line mates and you have Marcus Johansson. Need I say more <laughs> as your other. And he, that, that was his, those are his predominant line mates for most of the season. Yes. He did get some opportunities with Kaprizov and Zuccarello. He was productive in those instances. And then he spent the entire final two months of the season with Zuccarello and Johansson as his primary line mates. And why are we surprised that his production dried up? Because he was having to, by and large, kind of create for himself on yeah. that line. And so that's the only instance in which this is something that I would even entertain is if you have a deal in place to go get a Jack Eichel, or a because he's probably going to be involved in the package that's going the other way. That's the only way that this makes sense is to try to like finally once and for all um, end the one C debate. That being said, I am vehemently against um, trading Rossi after what he was just able to do because not only his on ice production. But the way he conducts himself, his work ethic, 
the what he does, all the little things that he does. Yeah, he's not a ice. defensive liability at all. If anything, like he actually battles in the boards, and he was only a dash four this year as well. He doesn't take anything any crap from anybody. Like he is he it doesn't matter if he is going up against somebody who is his size or is Zidane Chara's size. He is not afraid to mix it up. And Seth, most importantly, he doesn't take penalties in those situations. Bingo. Um, so there's so all of those things, he just he has defaulted to just going to the net. Something that there are only a couple of guys in the team that actually do this like effectively, and he is one of them. And we started to see him as the season wore on develop a little bit more of a shot from range. Yeah. So the only way that this should even be entertained is if you're bringing in somebody bona fide, you know, Brady Kachuk would be another one that I would, I would entertain it for. But again, you don't have the money to be able to do that at this point. And you have to give up a lot and you would have to give up a ton. And so at this point, I don't think it makes sense. The Some of the reports that the Wild are looking for a player with all of the Rossi components, just taller, like you're not going to get that in return. And so you would basically, you'd be punting on him as a player and admitting that you are in too much of a win now mode to be patient and to let this play out, which is exactly what you should do. Oh, absolutely. And you know, what's crazy is he, he's, he does have the ability to score goals. We, we saw that this year. We've seen it in junior. But like he's also a setup machine. And I feel like we mm-hmm. haven't seen that ability from him yet at the National Hockey League because the guys who are on his wings just haven't been able to produce when he sets them up, right? Like, yeah, he doesn't have that, like, he doesn't have that player that he can develop chemistry with, like, okay, I'm going to set you up and you're going to score, right? He's kind of just had to do a little bit of everything this year. And yeah. he did that all, like, beautifully, with, with what he had around him. So, like, if, to me, it's just... I bury my head in, in my palm. You know, I bury my face in my hands when, when I see when I see this. Because you know if they do trade him, he's going to pop. He's going to yep. pop, and he's going to put up, like, 70, 80 points in a year or two. And the Wild are going to regret it. And you know what? It's annoying about this as well. I know they have Yolek Shinek. I know they have him. And that's great. He can play first-line center. He can play second-line center. He can play third-line center. Like, he is there. He's the staple. They're not getting rid of him anytime soon especially because he's on a very, very good deal right now. But like, this is the piece that has the ceiling to get to that Mm -hmm. top center role that the wild have been wanting, that fans have been wanting forever since this team's inception into the National Hockey League. Give him another year at least. And if he plateaus, so to speak, maybe it's just like 50 points, but he, you know, he's a dash like 15 and you know, he does take a lot more penalties and just like the little things don't develop. Even if there's like a minor increase in points, then okay. Now we have two years of evaluation. He's got a, he's got a, you know, we, we got to pay, we got to extend him. L- l- let's actually make that hard decision, but like give him at least one more year guys. What? Like, yeah. Uh, um, I, th- I think about it this way. He very likely could have had b- around 60 points had he had capable line mates down the stretch. That team was so starved for anybody that could help that first line score. If the Wild would have had a second line that had the pop that we've seen the last couple of years with the Fiala line yep. and the, uh, the line last year with Marcus Johansson, you get something like that, he's the perfect guy to to set those guys up on either side. They didn't get that this year, which is why he ended up with 40 points, but he easily could have had another 20. And honestly, he could have gotten closer to 25 goals. And at that point, I think then you've got two wild players as finalists for the Calder as opposed to just one. Yeah. No, for sure, man. He, I, I thought he had an excellent season, you know, all things considered, with, with the team who didn't make the playoffs and if they do trade him or if they really, if the wild are serious about entertaining this move, like uh, the package in return, you know, like the the package or the player, I guess in this case, it it better be worth their wild man, because I'm going to be critical as hell. Unfairly. I will admit it. I'm going to be critical as hell on that player in return um, as a result. And I feel like the fan base will be as well. And, and, and that kind of sucks for that player coming in too. But, uh, but I think yeah, it's and you look at Jewel Erickson X career as a great example of somebody who it took a little while to kind of figure it out. 
But then once he did, he's been incredibly good. Marco Rossi did something in his first full season that Jewel Erickson Eck didn't do until like year four, which I'm was pretty- hit that 20 goal plateau. And obviously Jewel Erickson Eck is much more of a defensive player than yeah, Rossi. Different, but- different ceiling, but yeah. But like you said, Rossi's not like Rossi is not a liability defensively. Yeah, I got so, one for you. Guess how many points uh, Sam Reinhart put up in his first season? Uh, 22. 42. So you want to know how many Leon Dreisaitl put on put up in his first season? I'm going to guess somewhere around 50. 51. Okay. Be fucking patient, Wild fans. If this is hockey. This isn't this isn't the NFL. You you don't draft to be a star player in the next season. That's not how it works. And considering that this guy had a whole year of his development taken away from him Mm -hmm. due to like a serious illness, right? A life threatening illness. And he bounced back to, to still, you know, be somewhat on track and put up similar points as a new center does in the national hockey. Like, come on guys, come on. What are we doing here? What are we doing? Some players in the first round take a little while to figure things out. Some players, some players never do. Some players that are late round draft picks um, become amazing players and high picks just never get to the NHL level. It is all about a player developing within the system in which they're picked and putting them in positions to succeed as much as possible. If the wild upgrade, whether it be through a guy like Marcus Johansson having a contract year, and Matt Zuccarello being more aggressive with the puck and not opting to pass as many times as he did and having a little bit of a bounce back himself. Marco Rossi is an, he could walk in on opening night and not change a thing. And he would be a 25 goal, 50 point center. Bro, you put him with one or Ugrin or, or Riley height. And then one of the veterans on the other wing. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be much more, that would be what I would much rather see. Like people are probably going to take me saying contract your Marcus Johansson as advocating for him being a line two guy. No, 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 no. So that's the other part of this. You get a young wing in that spot. And a lot of times young players, if they're put in a really good position to succeed, a lot of times they impress. And when I say that Rossi is just, he could walk in, having not changed a thing on day one and be a 25 goal, 50 point guy with better line mates. Best part about it is he is going to be one of the hardest working players on this team in the off season. And so he's going to come in. He's going to come into training camp after the off season. We're going to say, Oh my God, who brought in the, who, who brought the semi truck in here? Like he's going to, he's going to just continue to build, continue to improve continue to, to add to uh, his strength, add to his core. And he's he is just, I think, poised to be just a really solid player yep. at the level. I think there's going to be a few younger guys who are either, you know, coming out of junior, coming out of the AHL, coming over, you know, even Murad as, as an example, who are co- going to come in here and just be like, and own that spot. I, I, I really predict that Ross is going to come into training camp and be like, that top center spot is mine. I feel like Riley Heights going to be like, that roster spot is mine. And I feel like Kuzan Dienhoff is going to be like, well, wherever you fucking put me, that's mine because I can play anywhere. But uh, you, you know what I mean? I feel like there's going to be some dial. I feel like this training camp, the young guys are going to be the ones who set the tone, not necessarily the veterans as, as we usually see in the National Hockey League. And this is what we have been asking for, is the opportunity to see these young players step up and take jobs. Bill Guerin and John Hines talked about this at the end of the season. And so what needs to happen now is if you have a guy who is knocking on the door, if Riley Height is knocking on the door to take a spot and to be somebody who is going to have growing pains, like young players are not immune to having a hiccup here or there. You have to not hold them back. Yeah, like if they're ready for a spot, do not get in their way. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, let's turn the page here and talk a little uh, just National Hockey League uh, playoffs, Stanley Cup Finals in particular. The goddamn 
Edmonton Coilers stamp their ticket to the Stanley Cup playoffs I know, or Stanley Cup finals. I know everyone in Minnesota is happy that they beat Dallas. I am not. And funny enough, I'm the Canadian here and I'm sick to my stomach. It makes me, it disgusts me that my country north of the border are all a bunch of sheep, a bunch of plebeians bending over for this oil hungry team are you kidding me especially canucks fans it's like you just beat us you just beat they just beat us and you're and now you're rooting for them man it, it blows my mind that americans still throw this at me oh well, uh, your canadian team hasn't won so you, i don't give a shit i don't give a shit i would rather no canadian team win if it's not the the or if it's not the vancouver canucks because there's one canadian team that i care about and that is the red maple leaf that is the only canadian team over all of them, even my Canucks that I care about, right? And if it can't be the Canucks, I hope Amer an American team wins, right? So, so, so all you who are trying to rip on me, oh, you know, Canadian team as well, I, I don't care. I really don't care. I'm, I'm glad that they aren't winning. And you better believe that the Panthers or hashtag Canada's team this uh, this Stanley Cup Finals. I want nothing more than to see Connor McDavid cry on air with Wayne Gretzky. That would that would just be food for my fucking soul. Seth, what are your predictions for the Stanley Cup Final? Can McDavid carry his team to a championship? He's gonna have to. This uh, this Florida team. This is not a, this is not the Florida Panthers of last season they've graduated where, like yeah they 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 didn't find it and and like carry themselves through the second half of the season like and i think they're not as injured this year like every team's obviously like both the teams are banged up but i feel like last year like they were they're being held together by glue yeah this team has been consistently one of the best all season like oh, they, they have been offensively everywhere yeah and they're they have maybe the best depth down the middle of any team in the NHL. Um, insane. Yeah. Insane dude. And they're like, they're capable. I mean, they've got, they've got a top line that can kill you. They got a second line that can kill you. They got a third line that can kill you. And not only that from a scoring perspective, but they are going to beat the hell out of you. And so for an Oilers team, like they're going to have to get, Oh my God, this is my first opportunity in a Stanley Cup final. I'm going to go nuts. They're going to have to get that from McDavid and Drysidle because Stuart Skinner was fantastic in the uh, in game six against Dallas. But you can't face that volume of shots and that volume of just puck control that Florida is capable of. It, I, I would bet against him doing that the entire series. And so if Edmonton is going to have a chance to, to hang with Florida in this series, they're going to have to just get nothing but excellence from Connor McDavid and Leon Dreisaitl and Zach Hyman, Oliver Ekman Larson. Like they're going to have to offensively take it to the Panthers um, to win these games. Yeah, and I will give credit where credit is due, man. That uh, Evan Bouchard has been has ha had an incredible season, and and man, what a playoff run this young man has been on! Twenty seven points in eighteen games, and and he's not just riding coattail on McDavid and and Leon's, you know crazy plays right like he is setting up the play. He's scoring yeah. big goals. He he was the dagger that killed the Vancouver Canucks, right? Like McDavid and Dreisaitl weren't the issues in that series. It was this young man. And to be perfectly honest, Seth, he was drafted the same year as Quinn Hughes, um, as well as, um, God, I forget his name. He plays with uh, the New York Islanders right now. He's a big defenseman. Oh, yeah. He got um, like 70 points this year as well. But anyways, they, they were all in that like same like defensive draft class. And Quinn Hughes at that time was miles better than them, and and I didn't think that Evan Bouchard and that young man in uh for the Islanders would 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 be this good. Let's just say, but man, in hindsight, what an incredible defensive draft class in 2018 because Evan Bouchard's buzzing, Quinn Hughes has been buzzing. I'll, I'll get that kid's name up here in a minute though. But like, how impressed have you been with Evan Bouchard? I know we didn't watch a lot of Edmonton throughout the season, but throughout these playoffs, man, he's just been he's been everywhere, right? Yeah. Uh, Thank God they didn't trade him for uh, a veteran after his first 14 games in the in the NHL. Um, Shoot, well, even, even after his first full year where he got, I know he's a, he's an offensive defenseman, but uh, he got 43 points. 
Uh, even 2018, 2019, he had seven games, just one goal. Like, thank God they didn't abandon him after that. Noah Dobson, that's who it was. 70 points in 79 games as a defenseman, and he's the same age as this guy. I knew you'd get it. Yeah, I couldn't think of it. I totally looked it up on DB. I'm not going to <laughs> in a different tab. But uh, I remember, though, because uh, like all my friends, we we had the Canucks had a, a high draft pick. And I literally sat out like they needed to draft a defenseman. I knew they were going to draft a defenseman. And I watched so much tape on Dobson. I watched so much tape on Bouchard. But as soon as I saw Quinn Hughes, I was like, oh, my God, yeah, he's like arguably the best player yeah. in this draft right now. Like, let, let's go. Let's go. But uh, no, as much as I hate the Coilers, like, Evan Bouchard has been incredible. Connor McDavid, I mean, you, you can't say anything bad about him. He he's no. unbelievable. Dry Settle is has a nagging injury. Like he he is injured and he's playing through it and looks awesome. Zach Hyman's been absolutely buzzing as well. Nuge had such a great uh performance there in the Dallas series as well. Um uh, it, it it's just like fuck the coilers, bro. That's, it's just like that's just my genuine reaction. Like just it's like it's like you. It's like you being a Mets fan and having the Yankees in the World Series and being like, hell no, I'm not rooting for the Yankees. Well, th- this is the example that I've been that I've been given out. Um, it, it's uh, imagine if. You know, we don't even maybe have to like, right now. We're imagining, but this might be true in a few years. Imagine Toronto has an NFL team, okay? And they're like they actually in our lifetime, hell, in the next decade, like they're probably gonna they're probably gonna get an NHL franchise or uh, an NFL franchise. Um, imagine it's you know the Vikings play Green Bay in the playoffs. The Vikings fall to to Green Bay. Green Bay is going to play Toronto for the Super Bowl. Are in the Super Bowl? Are you telling me the Viking fans are gonna root for Green Bay because they're American, dude? Fuck no, absolutely not. Right? That has nothing to do with it. This isn't international play. The the, nas- the, the, the nation means nothing. The country means nothing in this equation. If you tell me that you know the, the New York Rangers are playing. Uh, say say the New York Rangers. We're playing the Edmonton Oilers. You tell me Islanders fans, you tell me Devils fans are me cheering for New York because they're American? Absolutely not. So shut the fuck up, you guys who are like, oh, Canadian team hasn't won a Stanley Cup. Or all you Canadians who are like, why aren't you rooting for the Edmonton Oilers? Fuck the Oilers. Fuck every Canadian team that's not the Canucks right now. Yes, I'm salty um, because that wound is still fresh. But uh, I don't know. It's just I, I hate that argument. And then dude, Twitter's been blowing up with it, especially especially with uh, Luke Gadzik on Sportsnet going ham digging into Canucks fans after they've been trolling him in his DMs. He like he's a Sports Center analyst and he's just been going nuts, dude. <laughs> mind Fever. you, mind you, Bxa had a great uh, had a great jab at. <laughs> At the Edmonton media, oh, I, I straight up think he called them like a, a bunch of clowns or something like that. I know I shared it in our group chat, but I didn't I didn't tee it up for for this. But Kelly Rudy like was like laughing. He's like, I can't believe you just said that. And he's like, oh, yeah, the, the BX like just calling out the Edmonton media for being some clown for a bunch of clowns. And then what happens? Gadzik starts ripping on fans. It was just too perfect. It was just too perfect. But uh, but I digress. Uh, who's your who's your prediction? Who's who's winning the Stanley Cup? You know, I uh, plug your ears. I um, I'm going with the Oilers in seven, but oh, okay. very, very much not going to be surprised because I think one of two things will happen. Let me I'll tee it up like this. I think one of two things will happen is the Oilers are going to run headfirst full sprint into this Florida Panthers team. And they are either going to get knocked out and will lose in four or five, or they will adjust Mm -hmm. like they did against Dallas. And they will find a way to attack this team. So that's that's a weird kind of a spot to hedge my bets, but I do really get the feeling that if Florida wins this series, it's going to be pretty ugly because it's like it's the it, it just feels kind of destiny ish with this Florida team. Like we were one of the best teams in the NHL the whole season and we're back to finish the job this time. So that, yeah. it would not it would not surprise me at all because, you know, that relentless part pressure like I talked about. If Stuart Skinner can't hold on this in the same way that he did against Dallas, 
Sergey Bobrovsky can win that battle. And we haven't even really mentioned Sergey's name yet. Like he's been outstanding mm-hmm. in the playoffs. He's been outstanding all season. And Bobrovsky's one of those guys where it's like he doesn't play anywhere in the middle. He's either and it, he's either elite or he's not, but it's not like he goes back and forth game to game. It's like he's yeah. on a run for a good chunk of the season in the playoffs or he's horrendous. And he's on that run right now. I cannot imagine that he's going to nosedive in the, in the finals. I and I, if, if, if these teams both get subpar goaltending in this series, like if the offenses just go nuts, I feel like Florida has the better chance to win with subpar goaltending than if, if Edmonton gets, if uh, Stuart Skinner kind of washes ashore, well, and look, that credit, yeah, well, credit to him, but he he's not he's he's not a Stanley Cup winning. He, he yeah. might be, but you know what I mean. He's not that cal. He's not a top elite goalie. He's mm-hmm. a he's a starter, but he's more of a one B in my opinion. I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I know I keep calling the Coilers the Coilers, but I'm trying to give them like. I'm trying to give him like you know some credit here and be as uh, as level headed as possible, but like he he is nowhere near the level of Bobrovsky, right? So like right. he's gonna have some good games and and shoot he he might be just on a tear right now and goalies do that in the playoffs, but like I'm I'm betting on Bobrovsky over him. Are you kidding me? To have let you know to have more consistency in, in the finals here and credit to him in regards to what he did in that last game against the Dallas stars, it was really sad to see Joe Pavelski go out the way he did now retiring. Absolute legend retiring on 67 points, by the way, at 39 years old, what an absolute beauty. I know he was never an Olympic gold medalist. Oh, Canada, but he should absolutely be in the hockey hall of fame. Um, One of the, one of the best American players in our lifetime, Seth. And how about being able to go out on your terms? Exactly, exactly. And the like game, said, the game didn't finish him, right? Yeah, he 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 decided. Still, rel- I mean, sixty-seven points. Jesus, that would have been second or third on the Minnesota Wild roster. I think twenty-nine goals too, just shy of thirty. It was like twenty-seven yeah. or twenty-nine. It was like just shy of thirty. Oh, this is this is good for Joe Pavelski, who had just an unbelievable amount of longevity in this league and getting out without. You know, he's, he's been injured a few, every, every player gets injured here or there, but, um, getting out with something left in the tank is, I think the way that everybody is, hopes to do it, um, to where they don't get, you know, and who's to say he won't get that itch to where he's like, yeah, maybe I'll come back for like a half a season, but it's just, there's something to be said about being able to go out on your terms as opposed to kind of having it taken from you or getting to the point where you are playing well past the point where you're still productive. And yeah, and you're being like sent down or bought out or, 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 you know, you never want to see that decline where the players aren't, aren't accepting that it's over. Right. And for me, it's like, it's, it's so evident in the fight game, Seth, like there's, there's so many like legends that I've watched who just will not hang up the gloves and they get, you know, and into their forties, they're just getting beat up by these young guys. And it's just like, stop. Like yeah. I just please like you're just shaving years off your life. You're just, and and in regards to hockey, you're just hurting your body. Right. And, and you're ruining your legacy. Whereas I love, you know, I would love to see Joe Pavelski come back for one more year. Um, but I'm, I'm so content with him hanging it up right now too. And what, a, like I said, what a way to go out getting to a Western finals yeah. game seven, putting up the points that he did uh, this year. I mean, I, I, I again, I, I have nothing but respect for Joe Pavelski. I, I, I've been a fan of him his whole career. There are a lot of good players that never even get to that point. Yeah. Let alone well, for finish sure. their career having just gotten to one. Yeah. Well, it is crazy to to think that like Joe Pavelski, Joe Thornton, Patrick Marlowe, Marlowe, you know, a little bit more of a decline, I guess, because him and Big Joe like hung on a little bit too long. But it's crazy that all of those guys had longevity all coming from San Jose. It's wild. Yeah. And, and and the amount of playoff games they played throughout their career, right? The amount of miles they had in their body and they still were able to play this long. I mean, like what, what's in the water over there? <laughs> I I would love to get a little bit of it if uh, if they have some to share. But I thought so. I thought that Duluth Superior water was like the best yet. Like, come on, guys, come on. <laughs> Where's the longevity <laughs> here? Knock on wood, knock on wood. Caprizov plays until he's like forty and with the Minnesota Wild. But anyways, um, I found the clip of Bieksa. By the way, you want to <laughs> you want to see it? Yeah, fire it up. Big story, Darnell Nurse. You think about his day, his morning. He gets to the rink, and he has to meet with the Edmonton meet. That's what I call the media. 
because they're raw, dead, and dumb. And he has to answer questions about his, <laughs> Kelly his Rudy's story. Face. Story Kelly Rudy's so think face about his day, his morning. He gets to the rink, and he has to meet with the Edmonton meet. That's what I call the media because they're raw, dead, and dumb. And he has to answer questions. <laughs> Jeez. Based Kevin Bieksa. Now, in res- like it, 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 the events here, Seth, couldn't have played out any more perfect because Edmonton Media, again, former enforcer, um, Mr. Gadzik over here, Mr. Luke Gadzik, who works for Sportsnet, but is is primarily an Edmont on the Edmonton beat. Um, he's getting a lot of hate from Vancouver fans. And look, I, I don't condone you know, trolling or anything like that, or like hate messages in, in DMS or anything like that. But like, bro, just ignore it. Like you used to play in the national yeah. hockey league, right? Like you, you are an NA, like you are better than all these plebeians by default. Right. And you're going to come out on a podcast and say this. It's, it, it's hilarious. Awesome guys. Honestly, it's a great day uh, to be an Oilers fan. No bias um, whatsoever. I'm happy. I'm also a little fired up too. Um, so I'm going to start there. Uh, first of all, PK doesn't know what he's talking about. He he went stars in six. So PK put in a sudden jab, a little subtle jab of PK or not, not really subtle at all. Just straight up jab at PK Subban as well. Taking your shoe, beat it. Second of all, I don't know if Canucks fans listen to this when they were oh, trolling, we when we were, when, when the, when the oil absolutely dusted them, they were, <clears throat> I just Mom. want to point out again, that was barely a dusting game seven. We scored two goals late, so get your facts straight, buddy. My account still will not stop with Canucks trolls. My tweet last night I shouldn't be smiling, on Twitter but, but just I'm saying congrats, oil country. I'm going through Instagram message requests here now, and the amount of hate and absolute, it's the most garbage, jitterish, gibberish trash I've ever seen. Canucks Twitter, you're an absolute joke. Your team's a joke. You're a bunch of. I will say, Canucks Twitter is is kind of a joke. Like it's 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 a cesspool. It is, but like you know, c- the team is not a joke, Lou. Calm down, calm down. Losers. So the Oilers are going to the Stanley Cup Finals, and I hope you guys are having fun watching it on TV and watching me on the panel because you guys are not there. So have fun with your little whining tweets, tweeting at me, telling me I'm a homer. The Edmonton Oilers are going to the Stanley Cup final. I mean, look, he he had like I said, said like he has a point. Like he can yeah. he can he obviously can be frustrated and annoyed because that that would be annoying as hell. But like airing out your frustrations as a panelist representing Sportsnet, where like okay, it, it's it's evident that Luke Gadzik is biased. He played for the Edmonton Oilers, right? And and I actually liked him when he played. He's very much an enforcer, right? Um, he didn't score a lot at all, but it, this was just like they they won. The the trolls won. Yeah, that's that's exactly what they're looking for. Anytime anybody and look, and I'm, I it. am beyond an opponent of the kind of stuff like the death threats and all that. Like, find those people and uh, and prosecute them. Like, we we don't need to have that in any setting, but. That's exactly what the uh, the the trolls are looking for is the attention and for you to go on whatever your platform is and to spend time talking about it instead of spending time um, basically not acknowledging them like that's that's just how the system works is they're like, well, hey, he is he's talking about us. That just means that we uh, we got exactly what we were looking for and we got to him. We got to him. Yep, absolutely. Oh, it was just so perfect after uh, after Kevin Bx so the the meatheads, the Edmonton meat, as I call them. Whew, that was spicy. <sighs> oh, I fucking love juice, man. That that's what uh, <laughs> oh, that's what uh, all like his coaches and everything would call him was juice because he looked like he was on the juice. <laughs> that's what they said. To quote the new Beetlejuice movie, the juice is loose. Oh, the juice is loose. Um, all right, let's turn the page here. Um, last week in in the final segment here, Seth, and and I'm glad I get to actually talk to you about this as well because we were talking a little bit about it off air, and I, I've been monitoring this story since uh, last week, and it's it's near and dear to my heart. In the opening 
segment of last week's podcast, I shared with you guys a story about a young man who played for a now junior A team, but at the time a junior B team in the VIJHL, that is the Vancouver Island Junior Hockey League, uh, a great league that I actually had the pleasure to work for um, doing play-by-play and and color commentary for the Peninsula Panthers. Uh, A young man who played for the franchise, the Nanaimo Buccaneers, Kenneth Boychuk, was allegedly involved in a a sexual uh, assault case, and it got as... It got as high as to the BC Supreme Court and the trial begun last week, literally the day that we dropped the podcast and the trial is now done here and we have some updates. So I'm just going to play this little video uh, courtesy of Czech News Vancouver Island and then Seth and I are just going to discuss further this story and just the just all the shit that's been going on in regards to sexual abuse, sexual assault, sexual misconduct in the world of hockey. But here's an update on that case um, involving Kenneth Boychuk in the Vancouver Island uh, Junior Hockey League. Junior hockey player Kenneth Boychuk heads back into the Nanaimo courthouse when he realizes he's on camera. The 19-year-old is accused of sexually assaulting a teenage girl in January 2023. During the six-day trial, the girl testified that Kenneth Boychuk, whom she connected with on a dating app, came to her home unannounced and uninvited. She says she'd been communicating with him through Snapchat and she had told him she was home alone. She testified he slapped and punched her to the point she felt she couldn't move and she was left with bruising. She says she did not consent to any of the sexual activity. Today, Crown Counsel and Boychuk's lawyer made their final arguments. Crown Counsel argued the girl had no reason to fabricate what happened and that she was a credible and reliable witness. The Crown says she described what happened in a lot of detail and that her sister, who saw her shortly after, testified she saw the bruising and injuries after the assault. Her friend also testified the girl was bawling when she told her what happened and also saw the injuries. The Crown says the evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt that Boychuk sexually assaulted the girl. But Boychuk's lawyer, Rory Ziv, who didn't call any witnesses, argued the girl's testimony was full of inconsistencies, such as the source of all her injuries, saying she lied to the judge numerous times. He pointed out she admitted lying to the hockey team's coach, saying she had filed a complaint with police when she hadn't yet. He says she initially testified she blacked out, but during the cross-examination admitted she hadn't. Ziv also pointed out that right after the incident, the girl took a picture of Boychuk in his shorts, which shows autonomy. Boychuk, who's from Edmonton, was playing with the Nanaimo Buccaneers in the VIJHL at the time. The BC Supreme Court Justice is scheduled to deliver his verdict later this month. So a few things there after this trial uh, went down. It was originally slated to just be a five-day trial, and they had an extra day. Um, One thing that his, uh, his argument, his lawyer got wrong based on all the information that I gathered um, when this story first dropped was that actually the victim went to the owner of the Nanaimo Buccaneers first bringing it up. And at that point she had not gone to the RCMP, the Nanaimo RCMP yet. Whereas uh, Boychuk's uh, lawyer said that she, that she claimed she went to the RCMP um, up before going to the team. That was false. She went to the team first before going to the RCMP. And based on the, the, all the articles that I've read based on all the reporting, uh, Rick West said, by the way, from TSN doing an outstanding job reporting on this as, as he does, he covers all these heavier stories in the world of hockey. Um, based on everything I gather and just that clip there, Seth, I mean, it, the sentence isn't going to, uh, be presented until, uh, as that clip said, as check news said there until later in June, but all, everything kind of points the direct points to the direction that this young man is going to be charged. Um, I mean, I brought the, I brought this story to, to your attention last week. Um, I sent you just some of the articles that I've been reading. I mean, w- what is your just general reaction to this and, and how do you think this plays out? You know, it's, I, I just am kind of, here we go again with, uh, with this because it just, it just seems like this just continues to be too pervasive of a uh, just acceptable form of behavior no matter what level you are at um, in the NHL. And it's not just exclusive to 
the NHL. Like it happens in other sports too. It just seems like for whatever reason, we just continue to hear about it in various levels of hockey. Um, well, and let's just let's just let's just call it for what it is north of the border. Yeah, I, I I just my continual my continual stance on these types of situations is that until there is punishment, um, and obviously, like if he's charged, there's going to be punishment that is uh, that happens with that, but. There just has to be something that is going to detour these young men from doing this. Like, and it's it's all about like the the questions of why. It's all about the power. Like that's that's all it is because you know. Uh, and I'm sorry if I'm stealing any of your talking points because no, no, please, talk- no, please, please. <laughs> we kind of talked about this before we hit record, but like. You think about the the woman's side of this, mm-hmm. like the reason that we don't see um, them come forward after this happens is because they they're the ones that have to handle the trauma. They're the ones that have to deal with the trauma of what happened. There are there are instances where many of them are are told to, you know, keep quiet or else. And so all these variables are why. And it's not it's not just women, but. We, you know, in this case, it was um, the trauma of having to go through that and how like, how does your life go on after something like that? And for the men in pretty much all of these cases, they just leave the next day and it's done. Like, that's that's why um, that's why we see such a gap in the amount of time. Like, well, this happened X. It should have been, um, it, it should have been reported, you know, a, right away. Well, if you, how, how does anyone handle any level of trauma? Um, a lot of times it takes your brain a while to process it before you can, um, before you can do anything about it. Sometimes you, you try to repress it. Sometimes you try to just move on as if nothing happens. Like the brain reacts differently to all of these different situations. And I just get like, it, it's just so frustrating that we continue to hear about these. And so I don't know if there needs to be like a one strike and you're out for any level of hockey. If you are, convicted of or uh, or charged with sexual assault of any sort like maybe you're just done maybe you yeah. just don't get the opportunity to try to uh, continue your hockey career or pursue professional hockey maybe you're just done at that point that's that's my biggest question is beyond sympathy and you know feeling terrible for the uh, the young woman who had to live through this. Um, what is it going to take to get people to, to get people to stop? Yeah. Like there has to be some sort of massive repercussion to getting you to stop doing it, to get you to where that little bulb in your head says, I shouldn't do this. Yeah. No, for sure. And and in this case too, this wasn't like this wasn't someone getting too handsy at a party. This 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 young man went to her house, walked, you know, somewhat forcefully entered, right? Like th- this was yeah, this uninvited. Was almost, yeah, uninvited. Yeah, this was almost like diabolical. And you're so right in that there 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 should be like a one strike, you're out. The the thing with this case that which is why I wanted to have this conversation is this kid isn't going anywhere in hockey, right? I mean, I'll bring up his hockey DB right now, right? Like he doesn't, or he doesn't even have a DB. He's only on elite prospects right now, right? Like the VIJHL pretty low level league junior B. Yeah. They just got into junior A tier, but let's be honest. They're not even on the same level of that as the BCHL at all. Yeah. Point per game in the, in the, in this league, just above point per game. Like he, he was a good player in this league. That doesn't even mean you're going to get, you know, you might be invited to, to a camp. You might be invited to an ECHL camp. You might get a D3 scholarship coming out of this league, right? Like 
the the only notable player off the top of my head who came out of the, there are two players who came out of this league were Jordy and Jamie Ben, right? Like there there's not there oh, there aren't a lot, right? And, and furthermore, I am all about our justice system in regards to innocent and prove innocent until proven guilty, one hundred percent. Where I just personally, when I was going through this article, when I was going through processing all this news prior to the trial, was this kid wasn't a high level guy. This kid what didn't have this kid hadn't signed an NHL contract because we've seen cases where you know this is why innocent until proven guilty is, is important. Where you know some some of the victims, male or female, in whatever case, you know, sometimes fabricates fabricate stories to get a payout, right? Mm -hmm. And and we and we see a lot of people that go to that defense in this day and age more than ever. You know, the the old boy or girl who cried wolf, right? But in this case, with the fact that like he wasn't a high level prospect at all, right? It, it's not like her speaking up was for anything at all, right? And then yeah. again, this was this was this was my process going through this when i when i first heard about this and she did testify right away i believe this happened um late 2022 and she testified january 31st 2023 and um and and right away you know an investigation had opened up that led to this trial so so she was on it right away which yeah. i mean proud of her to be able to do that right because like you said a lot of people live with this and 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 bury it for whatever for whatever reason and there could be a, a multifaceted of reasons right depending on the circumstance here so um like we said uh, the trial's complete he didn't him and his uh lawyer didn't really have a strong argument and i mean even that video just kind of showed that and if you guys want to I'll, I'll link uh, the check news article and the ctv and cbc articles in the uh description of this video as well but it it, it seems like this young man is going to be charged and uh and and i was i was telling i was telling you seth like he is he's lucky i mean and, and i and don't quote me on this because he's still he's 19 years of age so i believe he's when the incident occurred he was 18 so i i think he still is going to be charged as a minor but if he and he's from edmonton Alberta, if he was in alberta he would have been charged as an adult. Now he still might be in BC. Don't quote me on that, but I was just, and this kind of just came to me like just right now that man, if this occurred in Alberta at 18 years old, you're an adult. Right. And, right. and, and, and if he is charged, if he's prosecuted, he's, he's going to fucking prison where, and he, he very well might too in British Columbia right now, now that he's 19 years of age. I don't, I don't know how, how it works there in regards to if he's being charged like when the incident occurred his age or, or after the trial. Right. That's something that I will, um, I will report uh, back to you guys once you know in the end of June when we when we get the final verdict. But uh, God, with everything that I've gathered, like fuck this guy, man. I I hope I hope he, I hope he gets more than a slap on the wrist. Yeah, like again, you have to, you have to put a punishment out there, and it, it this is this is the thing about you know. I think the proper word to use is a deterrent. Um, this is the thing about having to do like a deterrent punishment is that in the first few instances, it may be like, oh my God, this is way too severe. And it's like, mm, no, we need to set an example at in because you get to like as a teenager, and like you said, I'm I'm glad you pointed out that he, you know, didn't stand to like lose a ton by having this potentially be fabricated. Like if you were to impose like a, a ban on a player at that age who was going to be something that all of a sudden is a consequence that will be felt. Well, and furthermore, maybe because we've seen this before maybe it he doesn't get that big punishment because they're because he is on his way to becoming a national hockey league player whereas here let's be honest there he wasn't right which i'm not saying that that's a good thing i i think that 100 percent if it's a high profile player and this happens you should get the same treatment as a you know a junior b player like there shouldn't be special treatment at all but this should be an example for those kids like the ones who are facing consequences now from the 2018 world junior, um, you know, incident there. 
Like yeah. they, they should all like this. There, there shouldn't be any special treatment, right? Like, like I don't even think Jake for should be even playing. Shouldn't even be, shouldn't even be allowed to play hockey overseas. Now it's, it's a completely different league. It's out of the country. I get it. You know, with, with what he did in Vancouver as well. So it's just, it makes me fucking sick, man. And I mean, and it's and it, like you, like you mentioned as well, like it, it's happening at all levels, both with young men to women, other men to young men, other men to just women working in NHL organizations. And we've seen a lot come out with the Chicago Blackhawks. I mean, many cases with that, with that uh, one assistant coach, right. And more players coming out to talk about that earlier this year, but as recent as a few uh, or a month ago, May 16th, an article came out from the hockey news where the Chicago Blackhawks face yet another suit that alleges fraud, breach of contract and sexual harassment. Seth, I mean, there was a former consultant to the Chicago Blackhawks who is suing the team who's suing the team's charitable foundation and chairman and CEO Danny Wirtz for fraud, breach of oil contract and sexual harassment. Nina Sanders, who positioned herself as the expert on Native American historical cultural affairs, was hired in 2020 by the Blackhawks in her effort to improve relationships with local indigenous tribes. The lawsuit um, on her behalf was filled in the circuit of uh, court of Cook County, Illinois, and um, she's seeking... uh, She's seeking a jury trial and an amount greater than $150,000. In the lawsuit, Sanders alleges that Wirtz promised he would create a position for American Indians to buy land to give the Sac and Fox Nation uh, and change the team's logo. If she decided to accept the job, he didn't follow through with any of those points. That's what the lawsuit claims. Uh, She went on to allege that she told her immediate supervisor that an employee had been sexually harassing her and tried to force her into his hotel room in 2021. The harassment continued into 2022, but nothing was ever done. According to the lawsuit, Sanders also maintains uh, she reported other incidents of male employees groping women. Wirtz ended Sanders' contract last summer, according to the lawsuit. Sanders accused the Blackhawks of failing to investigate and report sexual assault allegations against multiple individuals during the time she was contracted by the organization. Uh, She alleged the Blackhawks attempted to silence her by isolating her position in response to her accusations. Uh, And I quote, the Chicago Blackhawks have zero tolerance policy for misconduct and take allegations of in the workplace very seriously. In response to Ms. Sanders' allegation, the organization immediately conducted a thorough investigation with the assistance of outside counsel, including interviews with internal and external parties and reviewed uh, pertinent materials and digital records says words based on the information available to us. We found an insufficient evidence to, to buy her claims of note. The person identified by Ms. Sanders in your question are not have been independent contracts with nor employees of the Chicago Blackhawks. Oh boy, Seth, a lot to unpack there. Just, just right off the bat. I just want to say that like in regards to points of like changing the name and logo or whatever, like th- that's, you know, the, the owner can say or the owner of the, the chairman, or they can say that they're going to do that. I, I don't think that has anything to do with the, the, the meat on the bone here, right? The, the actual like, shit that went on that that we're that we're talking about yeah that that concerns me way less than what's actually happening behind closed doors and just the culture that we're continuing to see well past the kyle beach incidents with the chicago blackhawks well that's the thing it's a culture it's a culture of and it may not be a culture that um encourages those types of behaviors but i think the bigger i think the more important point is it is a culture that values winning above anything else and you know this was the situation with this was a situation with kyle beach and all those um conversations that you know even like joe quenneville was having about like we gotta we we gotta try to find a way to handle this so that it doesn't take our our Stanley Cup run away from us. Like that's that's the kind of stuff that you just can't have is an organization that is like we don't care about the other stuff. We we just want to win. And it's like I, I, at, at what point do we just get to the point where that Stanley Cup just gets taken away? Yeah. Like as as more as more stuff comes out, as more is unearthed from beneath the um, the rug that Chicago is uh, is trying to convince us is clean 
at some point you just are going to get to the point where you're like, you know what? We we're just, we're going to take it away. Like that, that's the only thing that these teams care about. And so that's the only thing of consequence that matters is like, okay, that Stanley cup championship that you won does not exist. People will go to look to try to find highlights of it and they'll find nothing. Like yeah. that's the only thing that it seems like is going to get the point across that this stuff is intolerable, but like the NHL will never do that. And so at this point, I'm, I'm at the same, I'm at the same situation where it's like the punishment has to be enough to detour teams and personnel and players from thinking that this is okay. And yeah. until we until we get to that point, it's just going to continue to happen. No, yeah, for sure. And after the internal investigation was completed, they actually offered to renew her contract and she in, in the beginning of 2023 and she declined. Um obviously here and then the lawsuit is 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 taking place. So it's just man, it's just fucking crazy. It's just crazy. And again, it goes back to like it just goes back to culture. And and I want to ask you because, you know, I, I'm still new to the United States. I've just been covering a lot of college sports recently. But like, is this is this unique to hockey or do you think hockey is just having a harder time covering it up than the NCAA, for example? I, I think I think that's exactly what it is, because. Because we I hear think, about this in hockey every year, and we only hear like once every few years a scandal in the NCAA or other sports yeah. here in the United States. But it feels like in, in Canada, specifically with hockey, historically, man, going back to the fucking eighties with uh, like Theo Fleury and 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 um, and Sheldon Kennedy, right? Like we're this this is this is not new, and it's like every fucking year in hockey we get an incident. And I, I think another piece of it is just the volume of hockey players that there are at different levels. Like True. It, it is, it far outweighs yeah. big teams, a lot even, of players. Yeah. Yeah. It may even be more than the rest of the sports combined because right. there just are so many levels. You know, you think about the, the number of different leagues there are in Canada, uh, take that and, and double it for overseas. And then America has their own, I think that's part of the problem is it's just that's a good point. These these instant incidents are coming from a much bigger pool. Um, but I I would say too, I think you know that NCAA is certainly very equipped to handle these types of things if if the situation pre prevents itself. And um yeah, like there was no way this VIJHL was gonna cover this up or BC hockey was gonna cover yeah. this up because they don't they a they don't have the resources or money to do it. Um, whereas like the NCAA, they are, you know, they're as they are as or more powerful than some of these big four leagues, right? Yeah. I would I would argue almost... that they are. I would argue that they are. Like maybe, maybe not the NFL, but certainly the NBA, certainly the MLB, and certainly the National Hockey League. The NCAA has equivalent power to some governments. Yeah. Like it's so wild. they have the ability to if something happens that affects a uh notable athlete. They have the ability to handle it. Yeah. Absolutely wild, man. It's, it sucks, but you know, we've, we've been meaning to talk about that story for a little bit. And then with everything that came out with Nanaima, I was like, right, we might as well just rip the bandaid off and, yeah. and, and dissect it all here, but we don't want to end on a negative note. Uh, we want to end on somewhat of a, I don't even know if I want to call it pause now, but just yeah. a, a different, you know, we want to turn the page. We want to, um, it's a hard right turn, but we're going to take it as I usually say, Last thing here, and I appreciate you uh, giving me your time here later in the week, Seth, as always. But uh, last topic that I want to dive into, and we'll just spend a couple minutes on this. Um, Patrick Kane, free agent. A lot of people are saying it didn't work out with him with Detroit. I, I beg to differ, given that he was pretty much point per game coming in, you know, yeah. mid-season. Um, what do you think is, what do you think is next for Patrick Kane? He's only 35 years of age. Again, 50 games played, 47 points. Like, is he the is he the Patrick Kane of you know years past? No, but he's, he's getting up there in age. There's a lot of wear and tear on his body from a lot of you know playoff runs, a lot of tough games, and just holding you know putting the team on his back for a, many many years. You know, a few years even after you know Jonathan Taves had his 
uh, decline. You know, his, his former line mate, his, his, his captain, his, his right-hand man. What, what do you think is in his future? Is it, is it, is it Minnesota? Because I see wilderness articles popping le- out left, right, and center, making cases that Patrick Kane should come to Minnesota. But Seth, how the hell are the Minnesota Wild going to fit Patrick Kane under their cap? unless they're going to get him for like $3 million, which you're not going to get a point per game player, even at 35 for $3 million. I don't think he's going to take that deal that an Eric Stahl took and then put up 40 the next year. That's the dream, yeah. but I don't think that's going to happen. This is interesting because I would probably prefer Patrick Kane over like David Perron. Um, but I'm just, I'm just so eh on adding in a vet to plug up a spot unless it's somebody that you can clearly define as like, okay, this is a legitimate upgrade. So what if it was just for one year? Now I don't, I think he's looking for like two, three years, but what if it was just for one year? I could be talked into it. I I think he certainly, I, I hear the, here's the key thing. I think he showed that he still has plenty left in the tank. Yeah. It was just a matter of making sure that he was going to hold up after that type of surgery. If you want my honest opinion as to where Patrick Kane ends up next, this just screams Colorado Avalanche to me. I like it. I didn't didn't even have that on my notes. It's just screams because they are going to have a major need for bottom six guys. And depending on what happens with Valeri Nishuskin, Gabe Landeskog, they're going to have a definite need for impact players that could come cheapish. Well, and, but if those two are on LTIR, well, I don't know. Nikushkin, like, there's no way he's going to be on their books if he's in the the player assistance program. But yeah, if they have some cap relief, like, you, this is an option. And Patrick Kane, at this point, he's going to want to go to a team that has a chance for a cup. And yeah. so, Edmonton would be another. They're on my uh, list. They're really, on my any, list. Really, any of those teams that um, are you know knocking on the door, let's uh, let's throw Vegas in too. Because uh, yeah, that might be gonna... a little bit harder to swing given what their roster and cap, but that that's definitely the type of team. For well, sure. and they're going to Vegas just because this is how they operate. They yeah. are going to make a bunch of moves this yeah. off season to clear up money so that they can continue to kind of keep things fresh and keep them from getting stale. And so maybe if they offload a bunch of money and Mark Stone just want needs that, you know, two month late start to the season. And so he goes on long-term injured reserve for the entire year and then comes back for the playoffs. Like nothing happened. Um, I'm not bitter about that either. It's like Patrick Reddy didn't work out at 35. So we'll bring in Patrick Kane. Like uh, honestly, and you know the the New York Rangers, there was interest, um, but it didn't work out with them, right? Yeah, it just—I don't think they're going to go back to that. Well, he he played fine in that you know first playoff series with them, but like, eh. I would say, I yeah. would say Colorado. If I was putting a list of teams together, I'd say Colorado. I would say Vegas. I'd probably say Edmonton too, depending on kind of where they're at, because those are all teams that are going to be competing for a Stanley Cup, and those are going to be teams that are going to have minutes that need to be filled. Um, when next season rolls around, we have Patty Kane and Evander on the same line. My God, that would be that'd be something like this. And this is like this is just what you see a lot of the time is these guys that were superstars somewhere else. They find kind of that second wins as um, as a second line player for a legit contender. And Patty Kane might be able to squeak out a few more years, unless somebody like the Sharks is going to give him like. Eight mil a year. Uh, yeah, man. I, just, I mean, sounds like he's beautiful, but like, I just don't. Yeah. He's I mean, dude, you're go... right. Though, if they're just like, yo, if you just want money and just to, you know, because like, yeah, if you just want money and just to play out your contract, sure. I mean, that that's an option as well. I think, and I mean, <laughs> this has been floated before, so this isn't new. But like, th- is this not the perfect time for him to go home and play in Buffalo? I mean, that's a. F- <laughs> That's a really good one too. <laughs> that is uh, that might that might take the lead because you've got a you've already got the coming back home to 
get us to the top angle with Lindy Ruff. Yep. And so they're such a good they're 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 just on that precipice of you know stepping into Stanley Cup playoff tier, right? I, I thought they were going into this season. Like on paper, they are, but some of their prospects, some of their younger guys just they, they need a little bit more experience. There's some injuries. It just it just wasn't their year. It just wasn't yeah. their year. But I, I really think that they're gonna take a step forward this year, man. And he could fit into their lineup. God, that would be that would be spicy. I like it. I like it. Because they were, they, yeah, no one really, like, other than their defenseman, who Ross Mustolian's an absolute stud, right? I mean, mm-hmm. Tate Thompson was good, but wasn't, you know, the Tate Thompson that we saw the year prior. Alex Tuck was great, but he led the points with 50, or he led the team with 59 points. Um, their high school score was 29 in Tate Thompson. Um, I don't even know who this German cat was with them. John uh, Paterka, shoot, he got 50 points and 28 goals as well. What a steal, 21 years of age. Um, but man, like they have so like their core is so young, man, that like that might just be the fit and it might check all the boxes. And I'm pretty sure they're not too cap strapped where they could like shed another veteran on the team to, to bring him in for sure. But, uh, yeah, Edmonton and Buffalo, for some reason, those are the ones that I just, I just have a feeling, you know, I just, yeah. I just got that feeling that those are going to be his, his, those are going to be two, two of his destinations. And, I don't know. Let's just say that uh, Wilderness, uh, they, they they made a good argument. I was not sold. I was not sold. I'm just going to say that. I'm just going to say that. What do you guys think? Let us know in the comments. You want Patty Kane to come to Minnesota? Where do you think he will land? And I also want to hear you guys' Stanley Cup uh, predictions as well. Uh, whether you're listening on Spotify or Apple, leave us a review with your predictions on Spotify. I'm pretty sure you can just comment on the episode now. So just, just go and do that on YouTube. Let us know in the comments, like the video as always. I totally forgot to give my Stanley cup prediction. I got Panthers uh, in five. I got Panthers in five. I think it's going to be too much. So no you, bias you, whatsoever. <laughs> you see the, you see the brick wall approach too. Yeah, I just think they have the defense, they have the goaltending, they have the depth, they have the grit, they have the speed, they have the youth. They're built perfectly for the playoffs, and they're Dallas, but better, you know? And Paul Dallas, Maurice will get on the ice and fight himself. I love Paul Maurice, man. Yeah, he, he is one of my favorite coaches. You know what I love about him? He's been coaching since he was in his 20s in the National Hockey League, and he's never played pro hockey. Wow. Yeah. So he's one of those, he's one of those unicorns. He's, he's been John involved Heinstein. in the National Hockey League since he was in his 20s, man. Yeah, he's, Unbelievable. he's an absolute beauty. He's an absolute beauty. But Seth, this has been a fucking slice. This is, as I say, recording with you is the best part of my week every week. Um, what do you got coming up towards the end of the week here on Locked on Wild, both on the podcast and on YouTube? We are ramping up draft coverage. In fact, uh, just recorded an episode that uh, will be posted here shortly, taking a look at a few more draft profiles. Um, so we'll do a few more of those, but I, um, I want to take a look at young players with the potential to have a big impact as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, we're kind of moving into what I'm calling lockdown wild 2.0. I mean, geez, I've been doing this for three years. It's probably time I try something a little different. And so in fairness, uh, it's been working in fairness, it's been working because you've, you've, you've come a long way, my friend works it, i've seen, I've seen very job. i've seen various editions of of uh of your work covering the minnesota wild and i have to say i think you've i think you've found your niche here my man we found we found that wheel but um i got a few things that are going to be fun that will cater more towards specific uh social media platforms um maybe not necessarily for one as opposed to the other um, short form stuff. I'm, I'm excited for it because I think it's going to be, um, just a, a way to further kind of enhance the show. Um, and to keep people keep locked and wild in the front of people's minds way more often than it is right now. So, which is so, weird to say because it's a daily show. So, uh, what's your first TikTok dance going to be to? <sighs> no, I, <laughs> I have a better, I have a better bit for TikTok. Oh, I can't. Um, than dancing. It's not going to involve me moving hardly at all. Ooh, I might but have to get TikTok then. <laughs> I think it. Uh, I, think I have not. I have not let the Chinese government access my phone yet, Seth. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> Just this goddamn American and Canadian government guts. 
<laughs> which is just as crazy at times. Oh my goodness. Um, what do we got buzzing? What, what are we, what are we going to be talking about uh, tomorrow? That's a great question. Uh, well, we, uh, we will probably do actually, you know what? I I've got an idea. I've got an idea for, uh, for a fun one here to kind of break up. I don't want things to get too stale with the, I, cause I know we've been doing the, uh, the revisited. I love those. Yeah. Which but thank I, you to everybody who's been commenting on Seth's videos and the podcast there. I joined locked on every, every Friday, just like Seth joins the soda pod, uh, for my episode, um, which will be back to Mondays moving forward. Um, mm-hmm. I join him every week and yeah, we've, we've gotten such good feedback from these, uh, these fun deep dives, you know, turning back the clock and going and checking out the draft. So just, I just want to say thank you to anybody who's crossed over from locked on, Anybody who's listening to this, you guys are fucking awesome. Um, it it it's been a blast, and I'm glad you guys like the content. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll be taking a look at a few players who could have a big impact uh, for the Wild this upcoming season. I like it. I like it. Well, Seth, as always, thank you so much for joining, and uh, I will see you tomorrow on Locked On Wild, and we'll see you back here on the Soda Pod next week. They not like us. They not like us. They not like us. Big big shout out to Seth. As always, ladies and gentlemen, that was a heavy one. That was a fun one. All the above. Like I said, the best part of my week is hanging out with my boy, Seth, talking hockey, and then just shooting the breeze, usually drinking a beer or two (laughs) for like an hour after recording. But before we end off the show here, there's two more great partners of ours that we want to give a shout out to, one of which is 7th Avenue Pizza. Big shout out to Matt and the crew for hooking us up with with so many pizzas for my buddy's bachelor party. I still have some content coming out, both on my City Life channel and the Soda Pod channel. It's in the works all around 7th Avenue Pizza. We got pizza tier lists, as well as some other things coming out. So big shout out to our friends at 7th Avenue Pizza. They will be 100% sponsoring those few videos. So stay tuned for those on the YouTube channel, both my YouTube channel and the Soda Pod. But if you haven't tried 7th Avenue Pizza yet, folks, what are you doing with your life? Seriously, I I question your mental health if you've never had a 7th Avenue Pizza before. Seriously, you know how many times I've talked about on this podcast? You listen to this podcast? Hell, we're almost 400 episodes in. So I know there's a lot of loyal listeners here. I know there's a lot of you who've listened to every single episode. And there's some of you who have not gone out and bought a 7th Avenue Pizza yet? Man, ditch the Domino's. It is. It, it ain't worth it, bro. It ain't worth it. Don't do that to yourself. Don't do that to yourself. Throw that in the garbage. Go pick up some 7th Avenue pizza today. They're located at Jerry Foods, Hy-Vee, Lunds and Byerly, and more. If you can't find a 7th Avenue pizza at your local grocery store, help ask them a why or hit up Matt and the crew on social media at 7th Ave Pizza and they will direct you to a store near You that carries those delicious pies on the shelf. The crew are so interactive on social media as well. If you have any questions, if you want to interact with them, like I said, they will reply. They will share. They are just so awesome. Super interactive on social media. Amazing local company. Matt and the crew cannot say enough good things about them. Best pizza. Amazing people. Local company. What else is there to say? Go get you some 7th Avenue today. Let me know if you cut that shit into squares or triangles. I won't judge. Okay, I'm 100% going to (laughs) judge. But I want to know regardless. 7th Avenue Pizza, proud partner of the Soda Pod. And last but not least, I want to give a shout out to our friends at Better Edge. It's a tough couple weeks betting on the UFC. My, My picks have been amazing. But, you know, putting those underdog... Putting those underdog picks together, you know, sometimes you swing and a miss. Dallas Stars being the Edmonton Oilers as well on the hockey side. Swing and a miss. Damn, Coilers. Don't miss out on any of the action, guys. Check out Better Edge today. It is an amazing legal betting app in the great state of Minnesota and 44 other states and we have a gift for you betteredge.com slash soda pod go to betteredge.com slash soda pod and claim your $20 signing bonus today ladies and gentlemen that is right 20 bucks on us if you hit up betteredge.com slash soda pod check out some of my picks every week for UFC check out my picks in regards to the National Hockey League check out what Hoppy's doing and with NFL you know it's It's just around the corner, ladies and gentlemen, MLB in full swing. 
there are so many opportunities for you to play and double, no, triple that signing bonus. Hoppy and I are going to continue to host game day pickums throughout the regular NHL season, as well as a bunch of other contests and brackets for you guys next year. So get familiar with the app so you guys can be prepared for all of those come this regular season. And if you're already using the app, if you're already loving the app, you can check out Better Edge Premium. That is right. Premium players have access to free entry to pick them, contests, order grades, advanced over advanced order filtering, API access, and more. More details, of course, at betteredge.com slash premium. But if you haven't even signed up yet, betteredge.com slash sodapod. Take advantage of our deal for you. Take advantage of some free money, ladies and gentlemen. It's an amazing app. It's a local company. And Greg and the crew are amazing. Betteredge.com proud partners of the soda pod no hoppy hour in this episode and it went long ladies and gentlemen big shout out to seth and big shout out to you that is right you the listeners the viewers if you want the full experience of the show as always go check it out on youtube like and subscribe we post videos every single week ladies and gentlemen every single day actually clips of our podcast live streams every wednesday and we got a lot more cooking on our YouTube channel moving forward. So be sure to subscribe. And for all you loyal listeners on the podcast app, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts from, you all are amazing. I appreciate you all. Don't forget to leave a rating and review. It just helps us get in front of more listeners. And on YouTube, like and comment as it just gets us in front of more viewers. It helps the algorithm. But that's it, ladies and gentlemen. That is it. Thank you all for tuning in. We appreciate you all signing off. I'm Isha Drome alongside... Seth Topo. This has been the Soda Pod presented by our friends at Better Edge, 7th Avenue Pizza, Northland Vodka, and Waggle Golf. Don't fear, just drink some beer and stay wild.